In this video, we're going to continue our conversation about controlling microbial growth by talking about the use of antibiotics to treat infections. Antibiotics are chemical compounds that are used to kill or inhibit the growth of microbes. Very commonly, these are used in a medical setting to treat and cure infectious diseases caused by microbes. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to be talking about antibiotics. So antibiotics by definition are antimicrobial compounds that are used to kill or prevent the growth of, of microbial species. Very commonly these are deployed in a medical setting to treat infectious diseases that are caused by microbes like bacteria or protozoa. Now antibiotics come in three major classes, natural, semi-synthetic, and synthetic based on how they are created. So natural antibiotics are produced by another living organism. Uh, so typically, uh, these are going to come from four different groups of microbes. There'll be two different groups of bacteria as well as two groups of fungi. So the two groups of bacteria are the streptomyces and the bacillus species, where a whole host of drug families are derived from. And on, in the kingdom fungi, you're going to have the, the penicillium molds as well as the cephalosporum molds, uh, which are common sources of, of antibiotics from, from eukaryotic life. Now, semi-synthetic drugs are, are antibiotics that are derived from natural sources, but have been modified for some reason. So uh, we, take a, we take a molecule like penicillin, and then we modify it to, to make something like ampicillin. Uh, the reason why, when we do stuff, the reason we typically do this is to either broaden its spectrum, that means take the drug and make it uh, usable against a wider variety of microbes, or to reduce its toxicity. So antibiotics are compounds that could potentially also harm the, the patient that you're trying to treat by reducing its toxicity to the host that can make the antibiotic much more useful in a medical setting. Synthetic drugs are entirely based on chemistry. They're created in a lab. Now, they might have similarities at the molecular level to natural or semi-synthetic antibiotics, but at no point were they derived from a natural species. They were created wholesale in a laboratory. Regardless of the type of antibiotic that we're dealing with, uh, they all need to have something in common. They all need to be, or hopefully should, they should be, selectively toxic. So what we mean by selective toxicity, and I know I've mentioned this in other videos, is they should be toxic to the pathogen, but relatively harmless when it comes to dealing with the particular host. One way antibiotics do this is by targeting aspects of microbial biology that don't exist in, the, in human beings. So great targets for a, a, a wide variety of antibiotics include the cell wall of bacteria, which is made out of peptidoglycan, a molecule that we don't produce. Uh, another great target for antibiotics are bacterial ribosomes. And this is mainly because uh, bacterial ribosomes are slightly different than, the, than eukaryotic ribosomes, which means if we, tar we can safely target those uh, with very limited toxicity to the individual, uh, to, the, to the host. So when we have a drug, one of the things that we need to first determine uh, for any drug is something called the minimum inhibitory concentration or the MIC. So the minimum inhibitory concentration is determined empirically. Uh, there's a couple ways to do this. Um, typically, you do it uh, based on any drug and then, is, and then relate it to whatever particular species you're trying to treat with it. You can do this on, on solid media. Um, you, put a, you basically soak a paper disc and put it on a plate with bacteria cultured on it and look how big the zone of no growth, it's called the zone of inhibition, uh, is around that disc that will tell you the, the wider the zone of inhibition, the, the more sensitive that particular bacterium is to the antibiotic. You can also do it in broth culture, so you just do uh, standard incre or a set amount of increases in concentration until you find the smallest dosage of the drug in which you won't get microbial growth uh, in response to the presence of that drug. Either way, the minimum inhibitory concentration is very, very important but it's gonna, because it's going to tell us exactly how much of the drug that we're probably going to need to give to get an effect against a given microbe. Once we know the minimum inhibitory concentration of a drug, the next thing we need to do is figure out how much of that drug we would need to give to a patient in, in, able to, in order to be able to treat an infection. We typically determine this, this is what's called the therapeutic dose, and the therapeutic dose is typically measured in the amount of the antibiotic you give to the kilogram um, mass of the person, basically. So how much per how much per their weight do you have to give that individual? 
We also have to figure out what's called the toxic dose. The toxic dose is the maximum amount of, of a drug that you can give an individual before you start to see harmful side effects or potentially kill the patient. If we marry this together, we take the, the toxic dose and we, and we divide it by the therapeutic dose and we get something called the therapeutic index. And the therapeutic index or TI tells us um, how much room there is between the therapeutic dose, i.e. the dose we need to give in order to treat an infection, over the toxic dose. So when we look at a drug, we would hopefully, uh, for a, a, a good drug, we'd like to see what's called a wide TI, a wide, a wide index, because that indicates that the toxic dose of the drug is significantly higher than the therapeutic dose. That's good news because that means when we give the therapeutic dose of the drug, we're very, very unlikely to cause any sort of toxicity in the patient that we're treating. If you have something with like a, a TI of 10, that would indicate that the toxic dose is 10 times higher than the dose you need to give if there is a, uh, to, to treat an infection. Other drugs have, have a narrow TI and a narrow TI isn't great. That means that the toxic dose is very close to the therapeutic dose. In other words, you're kind of already working on the maximum dose you can give that patient. So having a wide TI is nice for several reasons. First off, drugs that have a wide TI are less likely to cause side effects or problems in the patient that you're treating. The other good news about a wide TI is that with a wide TI, if the initial dose you give the patient isn't effective, you have room to increase that dosage without causing harmful side effects to the patient. However, some drugs that are still medically useful have a naturally very narrow TI. One great example of this is a drug called amphotericin B, which is commonly used in treating fungal infections. Well, amphotericin B has a very narrow TI, but it's also one of the most effective drugs we have for, for fighting systemic fungal infections. One way to get around this is to, uh, is to, uh, a, to, to work with something called uh, drug synergy or synergism. What that means is sometimes when you use lower concentrations of two drugs in concert, you can get a better effect than using either one of them at higher doses. So for example, amphotericin B is almost always used in combination with flucytosine. Both of those drugs have fairly narrow TIs, but you can give them in much lower doses if you give them together to your patient and you'll get a very nice effect from that. So very commonly they're used in concert. This is called synergism. There's also something called drug antagonism. So uh, very commonly, there will these are also called drug interactions. Um, pharmacists also have to be very careful about these. When a patient is prescribed multiple drugs, they have to make sure that these drugs don't interact in a negative way. One very common example of antibiotic antagonism or, or, or negative drug interactions is the use of cephalosporins in combination with blood thinners such as warfarin. So cephalosporins in general have a natural blood thinning effect. If somebody's already on a blood thinner like warfarin, um, they will work in concert and they could potentially cause internal bleeding or a host of other problems in the individual that's taking both of those drugs. The other thing we have to talk about with respect to NA antibiotic is what is its, its spectrum? What is its spectrum of usage? In other words, is it, a, is it a drug that can be used against many different types of infections, or is it a drug that works on a very exclusive set? So typically what we're talking about is a drug that either has a broad spectrum of activity or a narrow spectrum of activity. So drugs like tetracycline. Tetracycline is a great example of a broad spectrum antibiotic. Tetracycline targets a whole host of different bacterial species. It's effective against gram negatives. It's effective against gram positives. It's effective against uh, uh, you know, spirochetes and other types of bacteria. Why, do they, why is it such broad spectrum? Well, once you know what its mechanism of action is, it becomes clear. Tetracycline is one of the antibiotics that targets the bacterial ribosome. And since all bacteria have the same ribosomes, it's effective against pretty much anything that it can get inside at the back, in terms of bacterial um, in terms of its effect against bacterial uh, species. The good news is it's probably not going to harm your host. There are other drugs that have a very narrow spectrum of activity. Isoniazid is a great example. Isoniazid is a drug that very specifically targets the mycolic acid production in a group of species called the mycobacteria. So mycobacterium tuberculosis, mycobacterium lepri. Isoniazid was one of the earliest drugs to be used in the treatment of tuberculosis. And because it targets something that most bacteria don't have, it's pretty much only effective against that particular that that narrow spectrum of bacteria. Regardless of this, both broad spectrum and narrow spectrum antibiotics have their uses. So broad spectrum antibiotics are great, particularly when we when you don't necessarily know the nature of the infection. In other words, you don't specifically know 
what type of what bacterium is causing the infection so broad spectrum antibiotics like tetracycline are great because they work against a wide range and will likely be effective regardless of the bacterial cause the downside to broad spectrum antibiotics remember you have thousands of species of bacteria that exist in your body and are part of your your normal microbiome they're also going to be targeted by tetracycline so long-term use of broad spectrum antibiotics isn't great Narrow spectrum antibiotics excel at this though, because narrow spectrum antibiotics are only going to target certain species of bacteria. For example, things like penicillin tend to be pretty specific to gram positive bacteria for the most part. Well, penicillin is only going to target those bacteria. And it'll leave the other, you know, gram negative bacteria and things like that, that are part of your normal microbiota. It'll leave them alone and, and not harm them. The downside is you better know what you're targeting. So unless you know for a fact that your patient has tuberculosis or leprosy, you probably shouldn't give them isoniazid because it's not going to be effective. But the good news is, is when you're on your 12 to 18 month treatment of isoniazid because you may have tuberculosis, it's probably not going to destroy much of your normal microbiota because it's specifically targeting mycobacteria, which aren't commonly part of your normal microbiota. So as I mentioned just a minute ago, one of the things that can dictate the spectrum of activity for any antibiotic is what part of the cell is being targeted by that antibiotic. Otherwise, known as its mechanism of action. So just like we spoke about for physical and chemical controls of microbial growth, antibiotics typically target one or more parts of the, uh, of the pathogen's cell for destruction. One of the most common targets for antibiotics is the cell wall of bacteria. So the cell wall of bacteria is made out of peptidoglycan and drugs like penicillin, vancomycin, um, and bacitracin are very common, uh, commonly used to target the bacterial cell wall. So penicillins and vancomycin and cephalosporins actually target cell wall assembly. They interfere with the enzymes that actually help to link the peptidoglycan together, preventing the upkeep or creation of new cell wall. Bacitracin, on the other hand, actually interferes with the ability of the cell wall components to go across the plasma membrane to get outside of the cell where the cell wall is supposed to exist. The advantage of these antibiotics is that they tend to be bacteri uh, bactericidal. Um, without the cell wall, a lot of bacteria can't survive. Um, so the effect of, of prolonged antibiotic treatment with these typically results in the destruction of the cells. Certain, uh, certain antibiotics also target the plasma membrane. Uh, polymyxins are a great example. Uh, polymyxins actually interfere with the the uh, selective permeability of the plasma membrane. One thing we have to be careful about with polymyxins, they're typically used topically because remember the phospholipid bilayer that is the bacterial cell wall is also very similar uh, to the plasma membrane that is your, uh, the lipid bilayer that is your plasma membrane. Um, so typically these are used only on the, on, on the exterior surfaces. Um, in rare cases, they can be used internally, but that's only if you specifically want to clear out a person's GI tract and make it completely sterile. Other drugs seek to interfere with the bacterial metabolism. Uh, sulfonamides and trimethoprim are, are very interesting. They are actually quite broad spectrum uh, and affect many species of bacteria as well as other eukaryotes because uh, they focus on the synthesis of a, of a molecule called folic acid. Uh, so many species, uh, most species of bacteria and many other species of eukaryote have the ability to produce folic acid. Uh, the cool part is human beings don't. We actually acquire ours uh, externally. It's actually one of the vitamins that we are required to ingest. Um, there's a group called March of Dimes, and one of the things that they focus on is the, uh, the encouragement of women who are pregnant to ingest more folic acid. It's actually needed for creating our, our nucleotides that produce DNA and, and RNA and so on and so forth. But because we don't possess the enzymes to make folic acid, antibiotics like sulfonamides and trimethoprim can go ahead and target the enzymes that make folic acid in bacteria and other eukaryotes without harming us. So there's your selective toxicity there. In many cases, these actually tend to be only bacteriostatic because uh, without folic acid, the cells just kind of hunker down and wait it out. And once the sulfonamides and trimethoprim are gone, uh, they can actually go back to work and, and begin growing again. The good news is, is if the drug treatment is successful, the patient's immune system has cleaned up that whole mess by the time the drugs are gone. A drug called rifampin specifically targets RNA polymerase. Uh, so RNA polymerase in bacteria is slightly different than the RNA polymerase uh, that's used in, in humans. Uh, so rifampin actually safely targets parts of the bacterial RNA polymerase. And without RNA polymerase, uh, there's no transcription, which means there's no translation, which means there are no proteins. Uh, interesting thing about rifampin, which is commonly used to treat uh, meningococcal meningitis uh, and other infections, is that rifampin is a bright orange compound, and uh, the, the 
dosage is so high that quite often it gets into the, the patient's system and it will turn their bodily fluids orange. So they'll have orange tears and orange sweat and orange urine, uh, which can be kind of freaky when you see it. And you may want to, if you're administering it to a patient, let them know that it's perfectly fine that everything coming out of them is orange. That's just the drug leaving their body and is in no way harmful. RNA polymerase isn't the only polymerase that can be targeted by antibiotics. Um, DNA replication can actually be targeted as well uh, by the inhibition of an enzyme called DNA gyrase. So quinolones are great at this. Uh, quinolones act on an enzyme called uh, DNA gyrase, which is utilized during the DNA replication process. So remember, bacterial chromosomes are circular, and DNA gyrase acts to regulate how tightly wound around itself that circular chromosome is. Without DNA gyrase, they can't actually pack their DNA enough uh, to keep it maintained in the cell in an appropriate location. So quinolones are actually great because they target an enzyme, again, that we don't have. They target the uh, DNA gyrase that's only found in other species of pathogenic bacteria. One of the most common targets of antibiotics are actually the bacterial ribosomes. As I mentioned before, bacterial ribosomes are slightly different than their eukaryotic uh, counterparts. And because of these differences, they can be safely targeted by many drugs. So drugs such as chloramphenicol and tetracyclines and drugs like uh, aminoglycosides like gentamicin and macrolides like erythromycin safely target the bacterial ribosome. The way they work commonly is they, they will prevent either the tRNAs from loading into the ribosome or they will prevent the tRNAs from moving from one site. So remember, there's an A site, a P site, and an E site that are used, utilized during translation. Very commonly, drugs like tetracycline prevent the uh, prevent the tRNAs from moving from the A site to the P site and basically they just jam up the ribosomal machinery which in effectively inhibits translation. For the most part these are actually bacteriostatic. Again you inhibit that protein production and the bacteria just kind of hunker down. Again this is typically okay though because if you can inhibit their growth long enough uh, or inhibit their division long enough it gives the body's immune system time to come online and actually clear that infection. Dentomycin, on the other hand, actually is bactericidal and does kill bacteria. The difference for that particular activity uh, between, between gentamicin and other uh, ribosome inhibitors is actually at this point still unknown. Of course, one of the most pressing concerns globally in the world of medicine is the rise of antibiotic resistance. So antibiotic resistance is the ability of, other, of species, particularly bacteria, to become resistant to the antibiotics we use to commonly treat them. And this is particularly concerning because if we do run out of antibiotics, uh, we lose one of our best weapons in the fight against infectious diseases. So the one thing I want to remind you is that all of these traits that evolve to encourage antibiotic resistance are going to occur naturally through the process of evolution. At some point, a random mutation occurred uh, that is going to make some members of a bacterial species more resistant to a certain antibiotic. And over time, because we are now using antibiotics very, very commonly to treat these infections, all we've done is increase the selection pressure. By increasing the selection pressure, we're going to continually enrich those bacterial populations uh, or, or other organisms. We will enrich their populations for those that are more resistant to the antibiotics. And the other thing we have to factor in is that some of these microbes, particularly bacteria, can share these resistance factors with each other through horizontal gene transfer. The other thing to keep in mind is these antibiotic resistance genes have been around for a very long time in many cases. The only thing we're doing now is enriching for them by increasing the selection pressure and increase, increasing the pressure on them to share with each other through horizontal gene transfer to increase that antibiotic resistance. There are five primary mechanisms through which species gain antibiotic resistance. One way is simply by modifying the target. So for example, uh, one of the most common ways that tetracycline resistance occurs is subtle mutations in the ribosome to prevent tetracycline from being able to bind in the first place. If tetracycline can't bind to its binding site on the bacterial ribosome, it can't inhibit translation and it becomes useless. Another thing that can occur is the production of enzymes to either modify or destroy the antibiotic, either outside or inside of the cell. This is actually a very common way in which beta-lactam antibiotic resistance actually occurs. So penicillin and many of those cell wall uh, production inhibitors that we talked about uh, are considered beta-lactam antibiotics. They contain a structure called a beta-lactam ring and certain bacteria produce enzymes called beta-lactamase, an enzyme which actually cleaves that ring structure and renders the antibiotic completely inefficient. Some species just simply pump antibiotics right back out. Pseudomonas is great at this. They have something called an MDR or a multi-drug resistance pump. Uh, and what ends up happening is whenever the, whatever drugs get whatever antibiotics make it inside the cell are immediately pumped back out before they can have any effect. MDRs are very concerning uh, because 
First off, they've been shown to be spread very rapidly uh, in some species. And secondly, they can render whole classes of antibiotics useless all at once. Whereas beta-lactamase, an enzyme, can only cleave beta-lactam antibiotics and you can use another non-beta-lactam antibiotic to treat that infection, MDRs can pump out whole groups of antibiotics and render broad classes of drugs completely useless against an infection and cause uh, extremely drug-resistant versions of certain bacteria. Some species have structures that prevent antibiotics from getting in in the first place. So if you remember the mycobacteria that have that waxy mycolic acid cell wall, well, that's resistant, resistant to many things, including antibiotics. That is one of the reasons why there are such a narrow class of drugs that can actually treat infections like tuberculosis. Isoniazid, if you're on it, you typically have to be on it for nine, month, 9 to 18 months before you actually get an effect because it takes that long for it to actually work on those species and begin breaking down their mycolic acid cell walls and making them somewhat, uh, somewhat effectively destroyed by your immune system in the process. And a final way in which bacteria and other species can become resistant to the effects of antibiotics is by utilizing another pathway to produce whatever it is the antibiotic was preventing them from producing. Staphylococcus aureus strains have uh, evolved the ability to work around trimethoprim sensitivity uh, by using another pathway to synthesize their folic acid. In other words, trimethoprim functionally acts to block down their most common way of producing folic acid, but some strains have the ability to utilize another metabolic pathway to get to the same endpoint, thereby rendering trimethoprim completely useless. The one big thing I want to mention, Antibiotic resistance is not a new thing. It's been around for a very, very long time. In fact, there was reports of, of bacteria being resistant or developing resistance to penicillin uh, just a year after it was actually released onto the market. What's come to the forefront though is the widespread use of antibiotics to treat infectious diseases over the last 80 years or so has really just become uh, a major concern because what's happening is we're starting to see, uh, we're starting to see a couple major things happening. First, we're starting to see antibiotic resistance evolve in species where we had never seen antibiotic resistance evolve before. Second, we're starting to find certain, um, certain pathogenic species to become either extremely drug resistant or entirely drug resistant. So for example, there, are, uh, there is an extremely resistant, drug resistant version of tuberculosis that arose uh, that was first noticed a few years ago. Um, this drug is not, a, this particular strain of of mycobacterium tuberculosis is not sensitive to any of the, the common drugs utilized to treat tuberculosis. This is particularly concerning given that there wasn't a, a whole lot of drugs that can actually be used to treat tuberculosis at this point. And just a few years ago, there was a patient that came down with the first pan-resistant strain of E. coli that we'd ever seen. Uh, this is a strain of E. coli that is pathogenic. It's not the common type of, of E. coli that we see in your gut. And the other problem is it is not sensitive to any known drug. There is literally no drug that can actually kill or inhibit the growth of this microorganism. So if somebody gets this particular strain of E. coli, there is no treatment for them. That's the end of it. What's terrifying is the potential that these two stories could be a very common story for many species of pathogenic bacteria uh, that we thought we sort of gotten around being scared of. Um, we might go back into a world, if we're not careful, uh, where antibiotics are functionally useless and we're kind of back in the world of pre-antibiotic days, back in like the 1920s and 30s where people died of things like scarlet fever and, and, and other bacterial diseases. So how can we prevent this? Well, in order to prevent this, we need to look at what's causing the problem in the first place. One of the most common causes of antibiotic resistance is the overuse of antibiotics. Now, that doesn't mean that if somebody has an infectious disease that's caused by something that can be treated by antibiotics that you shouldn't give them antibiotics. Of course you should. But we need to stop prescribing antibiotics in cases where they're not gonna be useful. Just because somebody comes in with the sniffles, if you think they have a cold or a flu, those are viral infections. Antibiotics are useless. It's not gonna happen. The other thing we have to think about is, are antibiotics actually needed? So for example, if somebody has an ear infection, is that necessarily something that warrants the use of an antibiotic if it's just gonna resolve in two or three days on its own? I'm not, a medical, I'm not a medical physician, so I can't make that decision. But for a long time, we were so willing to just give out antibiotics that we've been encouraging this antibiotic resistance to actually evolve in these species. But another major culprit of antibiotic resistance is the use in, in, in agriculture. What you may not know is that somewhere around 70% of all antibiotics utilized in this country are utilized on livestock. And the main reason for this is that uh, the, the use of, of, of antibiotics in livestock is not typically used 
as a treatment for infections. It's used to prevent infections. And what has been discovered is that if you give um, cattle or pigs uh, or other animals uh, a low dose of antibiotics on a regular basis, you can grow more of them in a smaller area. In other words, you can concentrate it and you can have more efficient farms. The other thing that was noticed is there's actually a slight growth benefit to them uh, to being treated with antibiotics. In other words, they grow slightly faster to larger sizes. The downside is this. Livestock also harbor many of the bacteria that can cause, path uh, can cause diseases inside of us or can live inside of us. And all we've really been doing over the past 50 or 60 years that this practice has been utilized is encouraging antibiotic resistance to evolve in these species. And even if these species aren't particularly pathogenic to us, they can still exist in an animal alongside other bacteria that can be pathogenic to us. And horizontal gene transfer is a real thing. So there's a, an ongoing debate right now as to how much the use of, agri, uh, of antibiotics in agriculture actually contributes to the evolution of antibiotic resistance uh, and antibiotic resistant bacteria and species that can affect human beings. So one of the things that we need to think about moving forward is antibiotic stewardship. How are we utilizing those antibiotics that are effective and how can we utilize them best so that we cannot encourage antibiotic resistance in pathogenic species? We also start need to look at looking at other avenues of, of, antimicrobial, of antimicrobial drugs. Maybe antibiotics aren't the only answer. So for example, uh, some researchers have begun playing with phage therapy. Remember, bacteriophages are these viruses that specifically kill bacteria and don't harm us. Well, what if you could just find a virus that you could ingest that would target the, the pathogenic bacteria? That would be kind of neat too, because it probably wouldn't hurt you as well. So there are lots of different avenues of research that are ongoing. But the big thing is we need to find a way to get this, this increase in antibiotic resistance under control, or we're gonna have a real problem on our hands with an inability to treat infectious diseases. And some people put that timeline within the next few decades of, of seeing such widespread antibiotic resistance uh, that antibiotics might no longer be a thing that is useful in medical science. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I hope you guys learned a lot about antibiotics, how they work, what they are, and how we can help to maintain their efficacy for the use and treatment of infectious diseases. I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for tuning in. Bye. Thank you.